grateful to be here with you all this morning. It's an honor. Uh, I began this new season of my ministry at the BMBA in October. Uh, before that, for the almost six years, I was the pastor of Pleasant Ridge Baptist Church in Hueytown, Alabama. My family uh, lives there. My wife, four kids, they are at Pleasant Ridge this morning worshiping uh, with, with our church family. And I want to thank you for your legacy and for your support. Uh, uh, even as a pastor in Hueytown, Huffman Baptist Church has made an impact on, on many, many people. And so I'm grateful for the legacy that you have. I'm excited about what God is doing here. Uh, I'm grateful for Pastor Rob and for the ministry that's happening here, for the excitement and uh, the revitalization that, that is going on here at, at Huffman. And so I'm just grateful, so grateful to be here, grateful for your support to the association and uh, for your impact that you're having here for the kingdom. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Mark this morning. Mark chapter 5, and I would just encourage you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 5 and just leave them open there. Uh, Mark 5, we're really going to look through the entire chapter, kind of at a 30,000 foot level uh, journey through Mark 5. There's so much rich, good stuff in Mark 5. You could spend this week studying it and probably never get to the bottom of all of the things that Christ has for us in Mark 5. Uh, but this morning we're just going to kind of look at the surface and I uh, hope uh, be challenged and encouraged by what's happening in Mark chapter 5. Uh, in September of 2000, the leadership of one of the uh, prestigious premier corporations in our country, a, a company that had locations almost in every city whose name was recognized practically universally, uh, but they had a, a meeting with uh, a small little internet startup company that believed that the two companies navigating the 21st century would be better together than they are separate. And so the uh, CEO, the leadership of Blockbuster, sat across the table from a couple guys who had an internet DVD rental company that was very much struggling. And as they pitched the idea to Blockbuster about the potential for internet DVD rentals uh, that would be sent out through the mail, they said that the Blockbuster execs began to smile and eventually they realized that it was not because they were happy, it was because they were trying not to laugh. And so, blockbuster executives uh, basically laughed Netflix's executives out of their boardroom. That was in 2000. In 2010, Blockbuster filed bankruptcy, and Netflix is a universal name. And also in 2010, Netflix who was facing a similar crisis, a similar challenge, like Blockbuster had 10 years earlier, realized that perhaps the delivery of DVDs, physical DVDs, was going to eventually age out with technology and that they needed to begin to look at some other options. And so they, kind of on their own, decided basically that they were going to uh, pretty much abandon physical DVDs, and they were going to focus all of their energy and all of their resources on becoming an internet streaming giant. Now, I, I did find out that their DVD division still exists today, but basically it's been spun off and forgotten about by, by Netflix pretty much, and they have focused themselves completely on online uh, streaming. So we have two companies who responded to challenges and crisis in two different ways. One who uh, thrived, one who is a household name today, and one who, if I tried to explain it to my children, they probably would not even begin to understand what a video rental store would be like or why you would need that. And as we look at 21st century Christianity, I believe that probably all of us would confess that we are living in challenging times. That, that we are living in a, a, a season for the church here in 21st century uh, America where it, perhaps it is a challenge at best and a crisis at worst. And I believe like never before we are facing a crisis, something that's bigger than we can handle. But I don't believe necessarily, church, that this is a tragedy as much as it is an opportunity. What if, church, God was allowing us to face challenges in our world, the challenge of COVID, the challenge of distance, the challenge of, of division? What if he was allowing us to, cha to face these challenges that are too big for us, not so that we could see how strong we are, but so that we could learn to pray God-sized prayers? 
What if they're there not to show us that we are strong, but to show us that we desperately need an intervention, a God-sized intervention in our lives and in our churches? And so this morning, I want to and take this journey with you through Mark chapter 5. And in Mark chapter 5, we find three different people who are facing challenges, crisis in their lives. And in re- their response to this crisis, I believe, encourages us to pray God-sized prayers for our lives, for our families, and for our churches today. I believe that we find in this passage three characteristics of God-sized prayers that could revolutionize the way that we as Christians and we as a church face our 21st century giants. So I want to invite you to read with me in Mark chapter 5. And just because we don't want to spend a whole lot of time reading the the, the whole chapter all at once, we're going to read verses 21 through 30 to begin with. And then we'll come back and kind of fill in the context around these verses. So Mark 5, 21. And with Jesus had crossed again into the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him. And he was beside the sea, and then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him, And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. Immediately. The flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? Let's pray together. Father, God, we come today confessing that we desperately need you. God, we come confessing that many times in our lives we face challenges, we face giants, we face obstacles and hills and valleys, and Lord, so many times we try to handle them on our own. We rely on ourselves. We look to lesser things to try to be our Savior. But today, as we face greater challenges perhaps than we've faced in our lifetime, we come confessing that we are completely insufficient and we need you. God, today I pray that you would, in your church, ignite a passion to pray God-sized prayers, to have a God-sized hope and a Christ who has conquered all, Lord, that we would not be afraid because we are standing in your love, that we would not be afraid because we understand who has conquered death and hell and all of the enemies that we face. Father, today as we look in your word, I pray that you'd give me the words to say as I preach your message to your church. Father, I pray that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive the message that you have for us in Mark chapter 5. God, I pray that you would uh, eliminate the distractions and help us to focus on, on your word, not my words, God, but on your word, the source of all of our power and strength and victory. God, I pray that today, if there's somebody here who needs to make some decision, Lord, that you would give them the strength and the courage to do that before it's too late. God, I pray that today would be a day where we are not just hearers of your word, but we are doers. Father, bless this time of worship in your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning, three characteristics of God-sized prayers. And I think the first characteristic we find is in those, that, those verses that we just read in Jarius' story. And that is that God-sized prayers are the proper response to overwhelming circumstances. God-sized prayers are the proper response to overwhelming circumstances. We start in the middle of the text with a father in crisis. Now, Jairus is not just any father. He is a a leader of the synagogue. He's a, a religious leader who is probably a prominent man in this city, in this area. Probably Jairus is one of those people that you would enjoy having as a neighbor You wouldn't worry about Jarius. You would trust him to check your mail. You would trust that he was well off, that his family would behave well, that he was probably a man of character. 
He was a man who probably you wouldn't catch running, and you certainly wouldn't catch him bowing at the feet of any other person. But in this moment, we find Jarius in a crisis because his 12-year-old baby girl is sick. She's sick to the point of death, and Jarius has heard that Jesus is in the area, and so Mark tells us that Jarius comes running to Jesus, and he falls down in the midst of this crowd at Jesus' feet, and he begins to beg that Jesus would come with him because his daughter was going to die. And so Jarius, faced with crisis, runs to the one who can help, and that is Jesus. And Jairus is, is so perhaps convincing and Jesus is so moved with compassion for him that they begin to go towards Jairus' house. And you can imagine how impatient Jairus must have been to arrive. How stressed it must have been knowing that every second counted. But as they begin to move, this crowd that's gathered around Jesus, none of them are willing perhaps to, to sacrifice their opportunity, to give away the opportunity that they have for a miracle to allow Jesus to pass through easily. And so Jairus and Jesus and the disciples are moving very slowly through this crowd that's crowding around Jesus. And I'm a dad and I understand how frustrating it must have been for Jairus. To have finally come to this place, to have finally got to Jesus, to have finally found the solution that he knew was going to uh, impact his daughter that could be her, her rescue that day, only to have the whole crowd slowing them down. And they're slowly moving, and all of a sudden, in the midst of this slow, terribly slow caravan, Jesus stops to say, somebody has touched me, something has happened. And we'll get to this woman in a minute in our second point. But what we don't find in the text, and it could be that Mark, because Mark, I think, is, Mark writes a man's gospel, by the way. If you're, you guys are ever looking for a gospel, Mark is your gospel. Mark tells the facts. He moves quickly. There's not a lot of extra fluff in Mark. It's, it is absolutely, Jesus did this, and Jesus did this, and Jesus did this. Mark talks. He communicates like a man. That's the way that God, I think, inspired him to write. But Mark is a quick gospel, rapid-fire stories. And, and so Mark, what he doesn't include here is where Jairus stops and says, Jesus, we've got to go, come on. And you know why I think he doesn't include it? Because I don't think he did it. And I don't think that Jairus demonstrated this great faith in Christ because he is a, a, a hero of the faith, because he is some type of superhuman person with superhuman faith. But I think that Jairus can demonstrate this type of patience because he knows who he's leaning into. He knows who he's with. And because he is with Christ, because he ran to Christ, and, and his response and his hope was in Christ, he has a peace and a confidence that kind of uh, just exudes faith. See, he had peace because he knew that he was with Christ, because he had run to Christ in response to the crisis. Overwhelming circumstances should compel us to run to Christ, to spend some time leaning in to Jesus. And so we begin to pray God-sized prayers, a God-sized prayer like, Jesus, come and touch my daughter, and I know that she'll be healed. God-sized prayers like, Jesus, we need a healing in our community because there's all kind of division. Jesus, we need an awakening, a revival in our churches and in this land because there's so much pain and so much darkness and so much sin. Amen. I was a student pastor in Slapout, Alabama. Has anybody ever heard of Slapout, Alabama? Of one person, a couple of you know where Slapout is. I'm, I'm with, with people, right? My people here, my wife grew up in Slapout and uh, that's where we began our ministry together. I was a student pastor there at Hopeful Riverside Baptist Church and uh, we just absolutely loved that church. That was where our, our first child was born. It was a church where we experienced a lot of healing uh, as a couple from some tragedy in ministry that we had experienced. But it was a beautiful place for us. And it was a place where I kind of felt like I had matured and really kind of figured out student ministry. My first son, Riley, who's 14 now, he was born... And uh, as he began to grow, we began to look and notice that there was something, there was something not quite right about one of his eyes. Uh, it watered a lot, it swelled a little bit. 
And we kept going to the pediatrician's office, and we went to, my wife worked at, at one of the best pediatrician's offices in Montgomery, and so we trusted these guys. They had a, a ton of experience, and we would go to the pediatrician, and we would say, hey, would you look at his eye? There's something wrong, and he would just say, hey, it's just allergies, it's fine. Y'all are just being f- worrisome first-time parents. Calm down. And we would go back and we'd say, hey, something's wrong with Riley's eye, can you look at it? And eventually, after months, uh, we saw a different pediatrician in the practice. And the, he looked at Riley's eye and he said, there's something that I don't recognize here. And we need you to go to Birmingham and see a doctor. So we ended up here at Callahan and we saw Dr. Kogan. And as soon as Dr. Kogan looked in Riley's eye, he knew exactly what was going on. Riley was born with uh, infantile glaucoma, something that we had never heard of, something that the doctors in my wife's office had never even seen or heard of in, in all of their years together of practice. But basically his eye wouldn't drain, and so it continued to get big. It was doing some damage to, to the lens and to the eye, and Dr. Kogan said the solution is a surgery. And so we took our little six-month-old boy and we brought him up here to Children's one morning, had to not feed him, which is rough on us as adults who understand why you can't eat. It's terrible on a a, a child who doesn't understand what's going on. But we watched as they took him back to the back and they did a surgery and they brought him back. We went back to Dr. Kogan a couple weeks later and he looked and he said the surgery didn't work. He said, we got to do another one. And so we went through it all again, back to Birmingham, another early morning at Children's Hospital, another surgery, and uh, we went back to Dr. Kogan after it was over, and he said, the surgery didn't work. Man, and we were crushed, because we don't know, we didn't know, I mean, what's this going to mean for his kind of long-term eyesight? We know that it's continuing to damage, and we know that eventually you're going to run out of surgeries, and Dr. Kogan said, we can come back and do another type of surgery, it might work, but hope was growing dim. And I can remember laying in my bed one night with Bridget, and we were kind of processing everything that was going on, knowing that in the next couple weeks we'd be back at Children's. And here I was, a a minister in a church who was telling people how great God was. And as we laid there, Bridget and my wife, I'm so grateful for godly women, for godly wives. She said, Josh, she said, how come we haven't asked the church to pray? You talk about a punch in the gut. The Bible's pretty clear when we're sick that we should ask the church to pray. We had never done it. And I was like, I don't, I don't know, but I know why. It's because I was too prideful. Because I thought that we could handle it. And I was trusting in all of the wrong things. And so we asked our church to pray. And I can remember that Sunday night when the deacons and our pastor and everybody gathered around Riley. And they kind of laid hands on him. And and they prayed that next Monday we were coming back up here to Birmingham to have surgery. And you can say, well, it's just a coincidence. You can say that it's just that eventually surgery would have worked. And that medical uh, advancements eventually could have fixed this problem. But the next surgery worked. And I am convinced that it was because we finally ran to Christ. And that's what we find Jarius doing. As we look around our world today, I wonder how many of us are in this situation where we're trying to handle things on our own rather than genuinely running to Christ and leaning into him. And Jairus' situation is so bad that before they get to the house, someone comes and they tell him the words. They say to him the things that you would never, never want to hear. Don't bother the master because your daughter's dead. Can you imagine his heart when he heard those words? Your daughter is gone. And Jesus basically just looks at him, I love it, and says, don't worry, everything's going to be okay, let's just keep going. And they arrive at the house, and the house is, is, is wailing. The people, the neighbors have gathered, and this is not dignified southern grieving around a potluck where everybody's just gathered around and saying the right things. This house is in chaos, and people are wailing and grieving loudly over this daughter who has died. And as Jesus and Jairus walk in, Jesus says, you need to get these folks out of here because she's not dead, and everybody's laughing at Jesus. And the situation seems terrible. And Jesus walks in. He clears the house. He calls a girl, grabs her by the hand, and he lifts her up and walks out with this girl who is as good as dead, walks out of this room to give her back to her family in the face of all of the folks who are watching. 
And what we learn from Jairus, my friend, is that no matter how well we think we have our lives together, no matter how religious we are, no matter how secure we are in our budgets or in our abilities or in our talents, we are not immune to trouble. We are not immune to challenges. And as we look at these challenges, we can understand that Jesus has in fact promised us that we will have trouble in this world. We will have challenges. We will face crisis. But listen to what Jesus says when he tells us about these challenges. He said, I have said these things to you, and this is in John 16, 33, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus says, we will have trouble, we will face trial, that it's not going to be sunshine and roses, but take heart because Jesus is the one who has overcome the world. He is the one who is victorious. And so when we find ourselves facing overwhelming circumstances, we can trust that God is still in control. When the world says it's too late, there's no hope for that family, there's no hope for that person, there's no hope for that relationship, there's no hope for that church, we can trust that Jesus is calling us to lean into him and to believe and to know that he is enough and that he will be glorified in, the, in spite of our challenges. Now, I don't imagine that Jairus' game plan for this day involved hearing your daughter has died. I don't imagine that his game plan involves seeing the mourners. See, but Christ had a better plan. And if Jairus' plan had worked out, we probably wouldn't be talking about it today. But because God was working his plan, we're talking about it 2,000 years later. And when we're faced with crisis, there's an opportunity for us to pray God-sized prayers and to hope that God's solution, no matter how odd, no matter how contrary it is to what we think should happen, that God's solution is best and that he will accomplish his will because of our surrender. And when we surrender and pray God-sized prayers in response to a crisis, perhaps our faith and our surrender will inspire the generations behind us to trust that our God is big enough to handle their challenges. So the first thing that we see is that God-sized prayers are the appropriate response to crisis. The next thing that we see is that God-sized prayers place their hope in Christ alone. This is where we come back to that little... Uh, interjected story that mark gave us in the midst of the story of jarius and his daughter this woman who interrupted jarius's story another hopeless person who's facing a crisis hers is a crisis of her own health jarius's daughter was 12 years old when Jesus reached out to, to uh, raise her from the dead and for her entire lifetime there was another woman in the same community who was struggling because Mark tells us that for 12 years that this lady had been struggling with some type of, of, of hemorrhage, some type of, of bleeding disorder. And for us, you might think, well, that's not terrible. Things could be much worse for this lady. But for this lady in first century Israel, this is a terrible thing. Because this bleeding disorder made her unclean, constantly unclean. Which meant that she couldn't participate in worship with everybody else which meant that she couldn't just go off and, and touch someone, that she had to maintain her distance from everybody, that perhaps even her family, the ones that she loved, would hesitate before they embraced her because if they touch her, she's unclean. Anything that she's sat on is unclean. Every trip that she makes out of her house, she has to make sure that her condition would be covered so that she wouldn't be embarrassed in front of the community it's a constant burden that she carries, and I think perhaps we understand better than maybe generations before us what it is like to live a, a socially distant life, longing to interact with others, longing to be back as things were normal. But if the condition wasn't bad enough, Luke tells, or Mark tells us that, that this woman has tried to find a cure. 
that she's gone from doctor to doctor. She's gone from place to place. She spent all of her money. And we are grateful that we live in 21st century America where there are so many, so many amazing medical uh, breakthroughs and so much knowledge that we have. She's going to doctors in first century Israel and there's no telling what type of torture this woman has endured. We probably can't even imagine what has happened to this woman at the hands of these doctors who perhaps didn't even understand the way that the human body works. Mark says she suffered. She's gone everywhere she could go. She spent every penny that she has and there is no hope. And so finally she hears that Jesus is coming by and she decides to throw caution to the wind and her hope for healing is greater than her fear of public humiliation, knowing that she's going to be pressing through a crowd full of people, making everybody that she touches unclean, that she is going to dare to reach out to touch a, a, a prominent teacher, a prominent rabbi, making him potentially unclean if she gets caught. She's going to, to be so bold that nothing would keep her from Christ because she's tried everything else and everything else has failed. And this, my friend, is desperation, pure and simple. And you can imagine as she there, down on her hands and knees, hoping that nobody would notice as she stretched out her hand to touch the, the, the dusty hem of Jesus' garment. Mark tells us that as soon as her finger touches it, that she is instantly healed. And not only is she healed, but she feels it. She knows it in her body. All of a sudden, healing, wholeness. For 12 years, she hasn't known this feeling. But now, all of a sudden, she experiences perfect healing. It was instant, it was noticeable, and there is no doubt in her mind that she's been healed by the great physician. What an amazing story of Christ's power. But so many times in our lives and in our church, we look for saviors in all the wrong places. We think that time or a change or effort will be the solution. That everything will be better when I graduate. Everything will be better when I retire. Everything will be better when my kids are grown. Everything will be better when I have grandkids. Everything will be better when my husband comes around and, and, and gets his life straightened up. Everything will be better when my wife figures out just how great I am. Everything will be better when I can just find that person, when I can find my soulmate. In the church sometimes it's everything will be better when we just find the right staff. Everything will be better if we just have this, this key family come in. Everything will be better if we could just get a pastor who's exactly the opposite of our pastor right now, right? Everything would be better if, if we just had a, a young pastor or an old pastor or somebody who's a, a, a great preacher or somebody who just preaches really short and lets us get out of here. But here's the reality, my friends, is that until we learn to place our faith in Christ alone, we will always be disappointed and we will always run from mirage to mirage. We will always end up disappointed and depressed when we realize that our idols can't be our saviors. See, here's the reality, my friend, is that pastors, programs, relationships, budget, money, all of these things, they are good gifts that are given to us by God. But if we take God's good gifts and we turn them into idols, we can know that Jesus will not allow us to clutter up his throne with imposters. Yeah. My mom, a couple uh, this past year, started cleaning out her house her and my dad, and she found a baby cup that I had from, from when I was a baby. It's about this big, and at one point it was shiny, and now it's black, right? It's just this metal cup. It's all tarnished. It's got my name on it. So she gave it to us because she didn't want it in her house anymore. And so we brought it home, and we were decorating for Christmas. And so what I did is I just set that cup down, and a couple days later, my wife said, why in the world is that cup right there? And I said, I just put it there, and I forgot about it. And then all of a sudden, the light went off in my head. I thought, this could be an entertaining Christmas. And so what I did was I moved the cup to the mantle. And I put it on top of the mantle in the middle of all of her Christmas decorations just to see how long it would be 
and how many people we could come into our house, have into our house before she realized that that cup was there. And so the whole Christmas season is kind of like Elf on a Shelf, except it's just to aggravate my wife. I would move that cup all over, all over our house just to see how long it would take for her to get there and to know how many times like, uh, our families would be there and wonder, why in the world is Josh's baby cup in the middle of their nativity? Why is there a snowman standing on top of this baby cup in the Christmas village? Right? Why is this baby cup everywhere? And so it was just fun kind of putting it and cluttering it everywhere. But I'll tell you this, that cup has disappeared. <laughs> so if you're ever out at a thrift store and you see a gold baby cup that says Joshua Michael Cook or a black baby cup that says Joshua Michael Cook, uh, if you would let me know, because I would love for it to make another appearance next Christmas. <laughs> but she wasn't going to have that in her nice Christmas decorated house. And Jesus isn't going to allow us to put our trinket idols on his throne. But he's going to knock them down. Amen. And as we pursue revitalization, as we pursue ministry in the 21st century, whatever that may look like, we can trust that our only hope is Christ. Amen. Our only hope is Christ. Please, church, if you hear anything that I say this morning, understand that there is no shame, and in fact, there is enormous power in the confession that Christ is our only hope, Amen. and that neither we nor anyone else is enough, strong enough to win the victory. Is your hope in Christ today? Is He your only hope? He is our only hope, and we are destined for failure if we don't allow these crises and these challenges to drive us to him. So God-sized prayers are, are the proper response to challenges. God-sized prayers place their hope in Christ alone. And finally, and, and probably the most quick point that we'll have is found in the first 20 verses. And that is, God-sized prayers result in tangible testimonies of God's power. They result in tangible testimonies of God's power. So before Jesus got to Jairus, him and his disciples came across the, the lake, and they landed on the shore in a place that's called the Decapolis. And the Decapolis is not just one city, it's ten cities kind of that were there together. It was a prominent place. There are some who think that the Decapolis is where the prodigal son ran to when he ran away from his father's home. So it was not necessarily a, a wholesome place to be, it was the big city, and so Jesus arrives at the shores of the big city, and he is greeted by the oddest welcome committee that you could ever picture. Uh, Matthew tells us it was two. Mark focuses on just one of these men, but it's a demon-possessed man who's running around who has terrorized the Decapolis for who knows how long. He's completely naked. They said that they've chained him up. And the demons have so possessed him that he's busted out of the chains. And he's kind of lived his life out in the hills, terrorizing the cities. And when Jesus shows up and him and his disciples get out of the boat, this is the man who greets him. He comes up hollering the demons, speaking through him, wanting to know why Jesus has come to mess with them, basically. This brutalized man who's been uh, just terrorized by these demons probably bears the scars. You can imagine someone who's busted out of chains, someone who's lived uh, without the protection of clothing in the wild, that this man's hair would probably be insanely just matted and dirty. He probably smelt bad. He probably had scrapes and scars and blood and all over him. A terrible sight for most of us to see. Somebody that we would probably just get back on the boat and say, maybe we didn't need to be here. Jesus has a conversation with this, the demons inside this man. right? And this is such a great story. Go back and read it sometime this week because it's amazing what Christ does. But eventually, he commands the demons to leave this man, to go into the swine that are grazing there. And they, they go into the swine and they run off the cliff. And the people who are watching the swine go into the city to tattle on Jesus, to tell him what's happened so that they don't get in trouble. And all of a sudden, this man, this demon-possessed man, is normal. Mark tells us that he is sitting when the people from the city come out. He's clothed, and he's just having a normal conversation with Jesus. He is completely delivered, like that, completely delivered. Amazing. Sometimes when I read scripture, I don't know, I have a 
pretty wild imagination, but I try to kind of picture what it must have been like. And in my mind, this man who's sitting by Jesus looks like Ward Cleaver, right? Perhaps he's got a smoking jacket on, he's smoking a pipe, they're talking about something, uh, the rainbows and, and clouds. I don't know. I don't think that's in Scripture, and probably you won't see that in any commentary. That's just the way that my mind thinks about it. But this man is normal. He is completely delivered. He's completely freed. And the people from the Decapolis, they come running out to Jesus, not to congratulate him for freeing, him, for freeing them from this demon oppression that they've experienced, but to say, we don't want you here. We don't care that this man is sitting here. We don't care that he has been healed we don't care that he's been delivered. We just know that we are afraid. We don't need any part of you in our city, so we want you to leave. So what is this man to do? There's nothing for him to go back to in the cities. Probably his family has long moved on. Anybody who would have been kind to him at some point in his life has probably just grown tired of his just ridiculousness for years. And so he looks at Jesus and says, I'll just go with you. And here Jesus says, no. You're not going to go with me. You're going to go back into these cities. And I want you to tell everybody, I want you to tell everybody what, what has happened. And that sounds cruel, right? I want you to go back to these people who hate you because, because of you. Now all of their, their swine have run off into the, the river, the lake. But something beautiful happens that Mark doesn't tell us about in Mark 5. In Mark 7, if you keep reading, Jesus comes back to this area. He comes back to the, 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 the area of the ten cities. But this time when he arrives, something different happens. They bring a blind man to him. And Jesus, this is where he makes some, some mud and he puts it on his eyes. He speaks and this man is healed. And the testimony of the people in the Decapolis, the second time Jesus comes, is, and this is beautiful, it's in Mark 7, 37. This is what they say about Jesus the second time. He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. He's done all things well. He's done all things well. This was a man who was deaf. He had a speech impediment, not a blind man. Jesus healed blind people, but this was a deaf man. I'm sorry. But the second time that Jesus comes... They're bringing people to him. There's a crowd here to meet Jesus. What's the difference? Who made that difference? Why would that crowd come? It's because one man who had experienced Jesus' power wouldn't shut up about it. And he went from city to city and from person to person, showing them the scars and saying, Jesus Christ made a difference in my life and he can make a difference in yours. This is the beauty of God-sized prayers is when we pray God-sized prayers and God responds to our crisis, we're given the beautiful opportunity to show the world that our God is powerful, that our God is good, and that our God does all things well. The answer to your God-sized prayer for your life or for your family or for your church, it may look different than what you think, but when God works, you could become a visible, tangible testimony of God's power right here in this community. And if there's ever a season in our church's history where our world desperately needed to see that God is powerful, it is today. Wouldn't it be amazing if every Christian and every church placed their hope in Christ alone and leaned into him in the midst of their storm? And God begins to transform our messes into trophies of his grace for our neighbors and for the world to see. How many of y'all love hymns? Now I'm going to give you a chance to be honest, right? And your worship leader will tell me if you're not. How many of y'all have a hymn that you just don't like? Okay, all right. We're always really quick to say there are hymns that we don't like. My dad was a music minister when I grew up. My mom played the piano, and so I, I've, I've been singing hymns my whole life. And my whole life, there's been a hymn, and I may make you mad right now, that I absolutely couldn't stand. And it was in the garden. It was in the garden. I just, I never liked it. Anybody, is that your favorite hymn? Okay, I'm sorry. Here's why I never liked in the garden is because it's about coming and, and being with Jesus, right? And you walk with him, and you talk with him, and he tells you that you're his own, right? And that's beautiful. But then what does he do? 
he bids you go. Right? He tells you to leave. Right? And even the verse says, I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling. But he bids me go with a voice of woe. He makes, get away. And I was like, what kind of Jesus is this? What kind of song is this? I never understood in the garden, and I've never liked it because of that until a couple years ago, right? Because the man he wrote in the garden, his name was Charles Miles, and he wrote it in 1913. Does anybody know why in the garden was written? See, Charles Miles read John chapter 20. And in John chapter 20, Jesus has died. He's been buried. The disciples are hiding away. And a few brave women have ventured out to come to the garden. And Mary, in particular, comes to the garden looking for Jesus. And instead of finding Jesus, she thinks she's found the gardener. And as she speaks to this gardener, she begins to realize. And finally, when he calls her name, she knows that this is Jesus. And Jesus says, you know what? You can't hold to me. He says, don't hold to me because you need to go and tell my disciples. See, in the garden was a, a kind of a first-hand account of Mary's morning in the garden with Jesus. Right? It's not my least favorite hymn anymore. And I'm not telling you what my least favorite hymn is after y'all acted that way about in the garden. <laughs> but, but Mary, is, she, she was there. And she walked with him. And she talked with him. And he said... You are mine, and I'm never going to let you go because I've conquered death. But Mary, you can't stay here because you need to go tell the disciples what I've done. What a beautiful picture. And church, as, as we kind of wrap things up today, and we think about praying these God-side prayers, and Christ being our, our only hope, and knowing that Christ is going to use that to, to be a, a witness to our community, we are given the opportunity that Mary has to experience Christ's power, knowing that when we experience Christ's power, he sends us out to tell people. He doesn't let us see his power so we can keep it to ourselves and so that we can gather in our little circles and celebrate what Christ has done for us. He has shown us his power and he demonstrates his power to send us out. And what a blessing for us as believers who have experienced Christ's saving power as disciples who have experienced Christ's sustaining power to be able to go to our neighbors this week, to go to our workplace this week, to go to the grocery store or the school and tell people just how much our God has done for us and just what he can do for them. Let us pray that our churches and that our lives become this type of testimony. This morning, what kind of circumstances are you facing? See, I don't know the crisis that you're facing in your life. I don't know the challenges that you're facing as a church. I know that a lot of churches are struggling with COVID. There are a lot of folks who perhaps you're worshiping online, and right now that, challenging, that challenge that you're facing is just the fact that you long to be with people, but you know that you just can't be. And so you're struggling with, with loneliness or with being disconnected in a way that you haven't been in a long time. But this morning, whatever your challenge... Christ is our hope. This morning, if you've never experienced the, the freedom and the healing that is salvation, Christ stands waiting for you. He's waiting for you to stop resisting and allow his grace to work in your life. This morning, this is the time, this is the place. In a moment, we're going to stand and sing, and the altar will be open. If you want to come and pray, you can come and pray. If you want to grab somebody in the sanctuary and say, I just need somebody to pray with me, this is your time. But for now, I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. As we prepare for this time to kind of decide, this is the time where we have to decide what we're going to do with what we've heard from the Word of God. And so whether that is just to stand where you're at and to, to say a prayer, to give some problem to Christ, to, to confess that you've been trying to handle something on your own or that you've been looking for saviors in all of the wrong places. Perhaps this morning your confession is, God, you've worked in my life and I've kept it a secret and I know that when I get home there's somebody that I need to tell about what God has done. Whatever it is that's on your heart or on your mind, this, this moment as we sing is your opportunity to do business with God. Doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, doesn't matter what anybody else is doing, this is your time with God. 
So I'll be down here if you just need to pray with somebody. The church staff is here if you want to go grab one of them. If you need to, to surrender your life to Christ or just have somebody pray with you or, or join the church or make some other decision, this is your time. Father, God, we come confessing that we are weak and you are strong. We come confessing that it's all far too easy for us to try to handle all of the problems that, that we face in life. And so many times we make a mess of things before we run to you. So God, I pray that you would give us a passion as a 21st century church to run to you first, to find our hope in Christ, to lean into Christ when the, the crowds are slowing us down, when everything looks bleak, to continue to lean and to trust in him. Lord, to trust that your plan for your church is greater than whatever we have thought, to trust that your plan for our lives is greater than anything that we have planned to trust you as our only hope, to trust your will as the only will. God, I pray that you would give us the, the courage to share what you have done in our lives with the people that we'll encounter this week, to share these stories of your power from Mark chapter 5 with the folks who may need to hear it this week, to never, never allow this world to shut our mouths as we try to share the amazing blessing that is the gospel of Christ. Father, as we stand and sing, Lord, I just pray that you would speak to our hearts. If there's somebody here who needs to make a decision, Lord, let now be the time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.